our colleagues who are going to be joining us, like our colleague from uh, Rolls-Royce has a plane to catch to Madagascar. Uh, and it's, <laughs> yeah, so uh, probably we need to make sure that we stick to the timing. Exactly. We have also a tight schedule uh, regarding um, our colleagues from NLR, uh, exactly. who has to leave at 12 sharp. So, um, so I'll, I would say I'll that make start... sure that I, I, I will have uh, the, the, the timing. Uh, you know. okay. Correct. And um, it's absolutely no problem because we um, sh sh will share the um, whole conference afterwards on YouTube. So there will be enough uh, time for people who have missed some parts to uh, check it out later on. Okay. Just a reminder, uh, uh, we have two types uh, of panels. One is the welcome and the panel one. And the panel two is going to be in a separate uh, uh, link. Uh, so uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Karakulak will open the link at that time. So uh, it's not going to be tied up to the first link. So we have to go to the agenda and make sure that we join the panel two through that link. So it's uh, two separate uh, links. Uh, I didn't know that this morning, so uh, she had warned me. So there are uh, two links. One is the first welcome and the first panel. And then uh, we go back to the agenda and, uh, uh, you know, press join again for the second panel and the uh, questions and answers. Thank you. Ah, uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Langlet. Uh, uh, who was the lady who was trying to be you? Uh, Maya, my assistant. Uh, I'm sorry, I, we didn't know you, so we, we made a mistake saying good morning, Ms. Langlet, but good morning again. Uh, good morning. Welcome to our panel. Uh, it's, it's an honor to have you. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, we are really looking forward to, to see what's going on in Airbus as far as the the green aviation is concerned. We're hearing so many good things, but we'd like to see uh, hear it from the first uh, hand. So thank you for joining us again. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, we'd like to start uh, sharp at 10.30. We have two more minutes. Uh, we have a few uh, friends uh, who's trying to catch a bus. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, catch a plane. I'm sorry. Uh, a friend of ours from Rolls-Royce is in... Uh, 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 reunion Islands. I don't know if you have ever heard about this. This is a small island near Madagascar. So uh, okay. he's very busy to sell uh, uh, aircraft engines to Madagascar, I assume. I don't know. I, ah, I, you I, mean the La Réunion? Is that yes, the yes, that is the one. That is the little island. Uh, I don't know if he's having fun or he's, uh, you know, selling engines to, uh, the, to the uh, local people, but we'll see. It's a beautiful place. I've been there. You've been there? Okay. Yep. Excellent. 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 Um, can I quickly try to share just to, to test it that it works? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. So, just to test that you're seeing it and the full uh, it presentation. Says, it says loading. Okay. Uh, we see it. Uh, perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. This is perfect. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, how do I do this? Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, uh, Julia. How are you? Fine, thank you. What about you all? Uh, we're doing okay. We have uh, um, uh, very important guests, and we are looking forward to hearing their presentations and uh, you know how we move forward into the uh, the carbon neutral aviation. How is uh, the weather in uh, uh, in Italy? Uh, a, a bit cold actually today. <laughs> uh, well, I am. Uh, uh, just uh, this goes to everyone. Uh, we have a beautiful sunshine outside, so we look forward to uh, having you in person in Turkey sometime. So this is a, a, an invitation. Uh, I'm sure you've been here, but uh, uh, this is an invitation from uh, our cluster and myself. Uh, if not Istanbul, we will take care of 
uh, all good things in Izmir, uh, in the sunny side of uh, Izmir. So, uh, Ms. Langlet, have you ever been to, to Turkey? Yes, I have. Oh, yes, I have. I was just going to send a chat note. I may come back on that invitation. I, I, um, uh, I really like uh, uh, Turkey. Um, I've not been to many places. Istanbul is uh, great, really, really beautiful. And I just recently talked to somebody that I need to go back because it's been at least 10 years last time I well, was. Well, you will be the guest of honor. Please let us know and uh, we'll arrange something. And this is the most beautiful time. Uh, in Istanbul or also a little bit of a trip down to the uh, south of Turkey uh, yes. because the schools have started. There's no crowds and all that. So uh, just let us know. Uh, I used to be a, an old uh, uh, tourist guide, so I know the way around. Excellent. That sounds tempting. Thank you. Thank you. So, so uh, with uh, uh, all uh, uh, this, I would like to start uh, uh, the uh, uh, today's uh, event, if I may, please. So welcome, uh, all of you. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have uh, all of you uh, to this event. Uh, the event is called Survival of the Greenest, uh, uh, the, the Path to Carbon Neutral Aviation. Uh, we have a lot of uh, guests who are going to be talking about aviation, how we're going to move forward. But we have also guests uh, who is going to welcome you uh, uh, from Turkey, from Izmir. Uh, 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 so I would like to uh, uh, take the opportunity uh, to uh, introduce them. Uh, we have uh, uh, a welcome speech from uh, EACP, uh, uh, Mr. Robert Weiss. Uh, he's going to uh, uh, tell us what EACP is doing all about. Then we have a uh, welcome speech from uh, our cluster, Aerospace Cluster Association in Izmir, Mr. Vajit Shah, who's the vice chairman of uh, uh, our cluster. Then we have uh, Chalar Tukel, uh, who's the director of the Department of Climate Change and Zero Waste uh, from the Izmir municipality. Then we have uh, another uh, uh, speech uh, from the Regional Development Agency, Mr. Murat Chilik. Uh, uh, he's the uh, uh, Investment Support Office Coordinator, Development Agency of Izmir. So uh, uh, with all the uh, further ado, I will uh, uh, leave the floor to my good friend, uh, Robert Weiss, to uh, let us know What's going on in uh, EACP as far as green aviation? Uh, Robert, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you a lot. Um, welcome to everybody to uh, this event that we as ACP have organized together with our friends from uh, Aerospace Cluster Association. So Mr. Maskaya, who just made this great introduction, um, and the EN Network. I'm briefly going to share uh, my screen um, just for uh, one very, very brief presentation about uh, what ECP is. Um, just give me one second. And um, my position inside ECP is a support of the coordination. Um, my colleague, Mr. Niklas Schilling, who is the actual coordinator of the um, of this network, is unfortunately ill, so I'm jumping in in order to uh, support him and support this uh, this event. Um, ACP is um, a cluster network made out of um, 45 clusters from 17 European regions. Um, our aim is to connect the aerospace uh, world um, with regard to uh, the SMEs, so to the supply chain, sharing knowledge, encouraging growth, um, supporting innovation, and strengthening the relationships in between uh, different regions all across Europe. We have uh, members that come from Turkey as our um, uh, dear colleagues from ACA uh, up to Spain, um, UK and uh, Italy. So we have all of Europe represented in our network. Um, the ECP goals are generally learning about market development um, on an EU scale, but also internationally. I will come back to it in a few seconds. Establish an international network for a fast and easy exchange. So. Basically, the most important thing in our um, ever slightly developing world, in our fastly growing world, is to connect and to uh, keep a pool of contacts uh, all across uh, the world in order to exchange knowledge as fast and um, best as possible. We team up for joint projects uh, on a cluster level, um, creating consortium to uh, which we um, apply then for European Union uh, calls. 
we set up business and research opportunities for cluster members. And exactly this is what we are doing today. So this ECP uh, virtual B2B is an event that uh, was started last year, 2022, for the first time in the uh, 2021 for the first time in the sake of uh, the pandemic. And um, we are trying to replicate it uh, quite successfully this year in order to give our um, companies the opportunity to connect. Um, last point as ACP goal is, uh, ACP goals is to influence EU policy on uh, um, international level, on a governance level, in order to promote regional comp uh, competencies and capabilities. Um, our members, as said, are spread all across Europe. You can see a brief uh, map about that uh, below. We have uh, more than 5,000 companies represented in our networks um, with more than 500 research institutes and 240 uh, public authorities. Um, our worldwide network, as said before, um, comprehends mem uh, clusters from all across the world. Um, the, our preferential cooperation partners are those um, signed with the light blue. So we have uh, strong, ties, strong ties to the northern part of uh, America also to Brazil, as uh, well as to uh, Middle East and um, Asia, comprehending uh, China, Japan, India, and South Africa in Africa. With these clusters, we organize um, regular exchanges in our, um, uh, in our bodies, as well as an annual uh, Global Aerospace Cluster event, GAC event, where we uh, try to um, meet up and make network with all of our uh, colleagues spread across the world. Um, Mr. Niklas Schilling will be uh, more than happy to uh, respond to your questions if you would like to uh, reach out to him uh, with these uh, contact points, as well as myself as Associated International Affairs. Um, about today, we are going to uh, have two uh, main panels after this first in institutional welcome. The first panel is uh, regarding mapping the road to sustainable aviation, where um, Airbus Germany, Rolls-Royce, KLM, and Pegasus Airlines will show how um, tier ones, OEMs, and of course, uh, airlines try to uh, face the um, try to face uh, the um, problems set up by the climate change and how sustainable aviation could be implemented. After a short break, we will then pass to the second panel where um, CESOL, um, NLR, and uh, the Polytechnic of Turin. So. Um, where we have more um, cluster side, but also um, research and uh, institutional side will setting up the perspectives on technology providers. Uh, this second part will be moderated by Mr. Yamaskaya. Uh, said that, I would like to pass the floor to um, Mr. Vachitsa, who is the vice chairman of ACA for his um, welcoming as part of organizer of this event. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Robert. Uh, dear participants, my name is Vajit Shah, and I'm the Vice President of ICA, Aerospace Cluster Association, based in Izmir, Turkey. On behalf of ICA, I would like to welcome you to our event. Aerospace Cluster Association was established in 2010 in Izmir, Turkey, with the support of Asian Free Zone and the Asian Foundation for Economic Development, is a non-governmental organization supporting the development of the aerospace sector in the region in Turkey. AJA being the first aerospace cluster in Turkey is also one of the first members of European Aerospace Cluster Partnership, EACP. EACP is a well-established association of aerospace clusters in Europe with 45 members from 18 countries. Since 2011, we are working with EACP members to members regarding the improvements in the aerospace sector globally. We are also leader of the EACP working group, supply chain and technology, and the active members all other working groups under EACP. Having 73 members overall with the 47 sector companies, including SMEs as well as academic and individual members, the goal of AJA is to work, support the efforts for the global integration of the Turkish aerospace in manufacturing, engineering, design, and R&D areas. Our mission is to ensure Turkey to become one of the world's leading countries in aerospace, encouraging all industrial and 
academic activities, as well as supporting all the work in these sectors. In, addi in addition to other activities, following the Global Green Deal and the Carbon Neutral Aviation Initiatives is one of our priorities at AJA. In this respect, we also work closely with the global associations in supporting the FIFO 555 plan to Europe and reaching the 2050 net zero targets. We believe our event, Survival of the Greenest, the Path to Carbon Neutral Aviation, will support our efforts in reaching these goals. We would like to thank you all again for your attendance and support, and we hope you enjoy the upcoming informative panels and make the best of B2B meeting during the event. Thank you again for all. Thank, thank you, Mr. Short. Um, uh, thank you ever so much uh, for your informative uh, 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 speech. Uh, we would like to uh, invite now Mr. Shalar Tukel, uh, who's the director of the Department of Climate Change and Zero Waste uh, from Izmir Municipality. Uh, Mr. Tukel, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope my uh, slides are visible now. Yes, sir. We see it uh, perfectly. Thank you. Great. Uh, greetings from Izmir. Uh, my name is Shalar Tukel. I work as an engineer at the Directorate of Climate Change and Clean Energy at Izmir Metropolitan Municipality. I'd like to start by extending a warm welcome to you all on uh, behalf of the Izmir Metropolitan Municipality. So I wish this event was uh, in person so that we could meet face to face and we will be able to show you around and have you enjoy the lovely Mediterranean city of Izmir in this pleasant neither too hot nor too cold weather. Uh, aviation is my child, childhood ambition. Uh, I still think that airplanes are engineering marvels, uh, representing the pinnacles of humanity. So it's quite an honor to speak at such an event related to aviation. Uh, today, uh, today I will uh, give a quick overview of Izmir's stance on climate change and share some information about aviation-related emissions. I believe that my presentation uh, would um, provide you with some background knowledge and fit into the context of the event. Uh, before we begin, let me provide you with some background information on the uh, city of Izmir. Izmir is the third largest city with a population of almost 4.5 million inhabitants and located on the very west of Turkey and uh, on the east coast of agency. The metropolitan area uh, pro provision borders have progressively grown over the time. In uh, 2014, metropolitan municipality borders were expanded uh, to uh, provincial borders to cover 200 kilometers from west to east and 170 kilometers from north to south. Uh, so it is a large city in terms of both area and population covering a surface area of 12,000 square kilometers. As a result, it's incredibly challenging for a metropolitan municipality to provide and manage public and municipal services across large urban and rural areas. The main economic drivers in Izmir are industry, agriculture, and tourism. Uh, Izmir has long been a leading and forward-thinking city in the fight of, uh, against climate change. In 2016, Izmir prepared the Sustain Sustainable Energy Action Plan, also known as CIEP. In 2020, in line with the uh, Covenant of Mayor's 2030 targets and upon a new commitment to cut down carbon emissions to 40%, Izmir prepared uh, Sustainable Energy and Climate Action Plan, uh, also known as CCAP. Along with CCAP, Izmir also finished Green City Action Plan uh, as the first city in Turkey as a part of Green Cities program proposed by EBRD. Both plans are in line with Izmir Metropolitan Municipality's strategic plan, which was based on uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So last year, as a part of City Race to Zero campaign, Izmir committed to become 
net zero carbon city by two, 2050 with a municipal council decision. And very recently, I must proudly say, this commitment was further challenged by the European Commission's decision, decision to select Izmir as one of the 112 uh, climate neutral uh, cities to make Izmir carbon free and resilient by the year of 2030. Uh, at the moment, uh, Izmir uh, Green Action Plan and the Sustainable Energy Climate Plan are the major plans to pave the ways towards 2030 climate goals. So we decided to manage and monitor the actions within the plans together. So there are 61 actions in uh, 12, uh, 11 sectors. Uh, I'll just give you some uh, numbers from the Izmir's emission inventory so that you can compare uh, them to global and national levels. In uh, 2018, Izmir's emissions was announced officially uh, by the government as 520 megatons. So this is around uh, almost 1% of world emissions. As a result of our emission inventory, we calculated that Izmir contributes 25 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent which is around 4.8% of Turkish, uh, Turkey's emissions. Uh, metropolitan municipalities' own emission was slightly over 2% of all Izmir's emissions. Uh, lastly, I would like to stress on the transport and share of the aviation. Uh, so biggest share of the emissions in, is the industry in Izmir. Industry has more than 40% of all emissions. Uh, the second uh, biggest emission source is buildings. And transport is the third biggest source with 23% of share, which corresponds 5.7 million tons of carbon dioxide. In CCAP, uh, there are uh, six uh, actions are defined uh, and put into force to cut down 2.4 million tons of carbon dioxide in transport sector, which corresponds to, uh, to an ambitious uh, 58% uh, decrease until 2030. And defined actions mainly are to increase and promote uh, sustainable transport practices, such as increasing public transport, biking and walking share, low emission and traf uh, electric vehicles, smart traffic systems, eco driving practices. Izmir also uh, has also started to prepare sustainable urban mobility plan. Uh, since the major, uh, the main topic of this event is aviation and sustainability, I just want to say a few words on uh, emissions related to the aviation sector. So in carbon in inventory, based on the jet kerosene, kerosene uh, fuel sales in Izmir, emissions related to aviation was calculated as around uh, 4, uh, uh, 425 a thousand tons, which is 1.7% of whole city inventory. So it's, it is quite high. Globally, um, aviation is responsible for 2% of the emissions due to the jet fuel consumption. However, uh, aviation causes more global warming due to non-carbon dioxide effects. These are not resulted from the fuel, but occurs during the flight gases like uh, NOx, nitrogen oxides, and uh, are formed as air is burnt in the, the jet engine. And water uh, vapor called contrails uh, can also form during the flight. Uh, actually, it is quite fun to watch the contrails behind the jet plane, but unfortunately, wait, uh, water vapor also traps heat and increases the effects of global warm warming. So with the fossil fuel and non-carbon dioxide effect like contrails, it has been estimated that aviation is responsible, uh, aviation is responsible for up to 5% of global warming. Thankfully, there are many ways to propose, uh, ways proposed to cut down the emissions uh, and non-carbon dioxide effect. I think there is going to be a very valuable uh, discussions during this conference to mitigate the global warming effects of the aviation. Uh, so on behalf of 
the Izmir Metropolitan Municipality, I thank you all and wish you all the best for the successful conference. Finally, I will I invite you all to come and see the beautiful and modern city of Izmir. Thank you very much. Mr. Tukal, thank you ever so much. And we take this as a promise. Uh, so uh, we're going to be your uh, guests. Uh, not only me, but uh, we, we have a lot of uh, our uh, friends who would be interested to come to Izmir uh, and uh, enjoy uh, the, the good sides of uh, Turkey as well. So thank you ever so much for the informative uh, uh, presentation. Now, I'd like to uh, leave the floor to Mr. Murat Çelik, uh, uh, who's from the Development Agency of Izmir Region. He's the Investment Support Office Coordinator. Mr. Çelik, uh, the floor is yours, uh, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ilmaz Kaya, uh, distinguished participants, esteemed representatives of the international aviation sector. I respectfully greet you on behalf of myself and my institution, Izmir Development Agency, uh, which is an organization under coordination of Ministry of Industry and Technology of Turkey. Uh, welcome to this important event organized under the leadership of institutions that are also the main uh, stakeholders of the innovation and clustering ecosystem in Izmir. Uh, as Izmir, we host you online today, but we wish to host you also physically in the future. Uh, Mr. Tukal from Izmir Metropolitan Municipality gave a detailed information about Izmir, so I won't give uh, more details, but let me underline that Izmir was announced among the 112 cities in climate neutral and smart cities mission by Euro European Commission. So this development is uh, important uh, for us. Uh, as Izmir Development Agency, we defined uh, green growth and uh, blue growth as a coastal city uh, as the main uh, development access for Izmir. Uh, so this creates an eco-friendly uh, business environment for the investors and the business side of the city. Uh, in this context, I'd like to say that if you are going to make any project, any investment or any activity in sustainability in Turkey, our city, Izmir, is the right place. Uh, distinguished guests, there are many topics to be discussed uh, in this event, but I would like to draw attention especially to uh, sustainable aviation fuel and hydrogen since they closely concern uh, Izmir. Uh, the transition to low carbon biofuels or hydrogen is a big opportunity for the aviation industry to be decarbonized. Uh, Izmir has two refinery facilities which are among the largest industrial facilities in Turkey, and they also produce uh, aviation fuel. Uh, these refineries have started to make significant investment in biofuels. Therefore, we expect that Izmir will become an important uh, SAF producer uh, city in the future period. And uh, also, according to recent reports, Izmir offers the best investment conditions for the forced uh, first given hydrogen plants in Turkey. Uh, distinguished participants, as an agency, we prioritize clustering policies for the regional development of Izmir. Uh, besides aviation, important clustering studies are being carried out in Izmir in clean energy and clean tech, chemicals and software sectors, and these are interacting sectors. In this context, we believe that this sustainability event organized by aviation uh, sector cluster organizations will make valuable contributions to the Izmir's clustering ecosystems. Concluding my words, I would like to state that as the city of Izmir, we are ready to contribute to humanity's tackle of climate change with our vision, our institutions, our human resources, and our infrastructure. And we are ready for any collaborations with this aim. I hope this event will contribute to the realization of these collaborations. I would like to thank all organizers of this event and wish fruitful meetings for all participants. Thank you. Mr. Chedik, thank you ever so much. Uh, again, uh, uh, the, the first uh, thank you is inviting us to Izmir. Uh, we will make sure that uh, we will be your guest as well as uh, Mr. Uh, Tukal is going to take care of us. Uh, but uh, secondly, but not the last, uh, 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 you're talking about uh, the most important part of uh, the new generation of uh, uh, neutral aviation. 
which is the uh, sustainable air fuels and also hydrogen. As a matter of fact, uh, we have started uh, uh, recently a project with uh, uh, one of the biggest refineries in Turkey uh, to look forward to uh, liquid uh, hydrogen transportation. So there's a lot of things going on. Uh, we will be more than happy to discuss that uh, in the future. Now uh, uh, we're ready to start our panel, uh, the first panel. That's the mapping the road to sustainable aviation. So I leave the floor to Mr. Robert Weiss, who is going to be the moderator for the uh, for the first uh, uh, panel. Uh, Robert, uh, I'll leave the floor to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Yaltsin. Charming as always. Um, said that, I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Vachitsa, Mr. Chagla Tükel, Mr. Murat Cedik for their presentations today and for having joined us and for this institutional welcoming by the uh, municipality of Izmir. Thank you a lot for being here today. We really appreciate it. Um, starting now, we would like to open the first panel, Mapping the Road to Sustainable Aviation. Um, the focus here is, uh, as I said, on uh, OEMs and on airlines, on um, how their plannings, uh, future plans, in order to reach uh, carbon uh, net zero emissions um, are set out. We will start directly with uh, Ms. Nicole Dreher Langlet, who is the Vice President uh, Research and uh, Technology from Airbus Germany. Uh, we would really like to thank her for being here today and uh, Ms. Nicole Dreher Langlet. We are uh, more than excited to uh, hear what um, the plans from Airbus are for the future times. So uh, please feel free to share your, uh, to share your screen and the floor is yours. Thank you, and a very warm welcome also here from sunny uh, Hamburg. And thanks for inviting me and providing me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, so given the context of this event, I assume that all of you are somewhat familiar with Airbus and you probably have frequently traveled in one of our airplanes uh, so far. Um, but however, what might not be uh, so well known is the extent to which we at Airbus are transforming uh, every aspect of our company as our company uh, purpose is pioneering sustainable aerospace for a safe and united world. So the future of flying must be green. And I really like the theme of, of your conference here today because it's really a matter of survival. So the survival of the green, I think, is, is putting it right on the spot what it is about. And I'm very much looking forward to show you in the next uh, 15 minutes how we intend to achieve that here at Avis. So um, let's start with a brief uh, high level outlook of the world of aviation, how it will look like over the coming years. Um, so you will see that um, the, from the, what we have, the today's currently active fleets, it will transform over the, the next 20 years and uh, in more than doubling the size of it. So uh, based on actual data and forecast, we expect the size of the total fleet um, to be uh, as, as more, much than more than a doubling of what we see today. And the recent drawbacks uh, from the pandemic and other crises are already considered in this. That's a question I always get, is it really recent figures? But yes, it is. So what are this uh, uh, future air travel uh, composed of? Roughly a third of the 2040 figures will be re replacements of the fleets we see currently up in the sky. And as the operating costs of an airline are very significantly driven by fuel consumption, there is a very clear driver uh, and, and very clear attractive business case behind uh, the replacement. As the latest generation of aircraft burn 25% less fuel and therefore also emit 25% less CO2 than the previous generation of aircraft. Um, so this plays not only a very tremendous part in re reducing the climate impact, but it also serves as an incentive for the airlines to replace the their parts of their fleet sooner than initially intended due to the very long-term fuel savings that this can com compensate for. And of course, this really very significantly, as I said, 25% uh, already pays into the decarbonization of aviation with immediate factor. Um, in addition to the replacement of the current fleets, we can anticipate a major growth in the industry overall, to a large extent coming from Asia and other emerging markets. Um, and this chart is giving you a very good illustration of what lies ahead. Um, while this is very good news, and, and we clearly see that also in our uh, order books, which are confirming uh, these figures and the trends, it does also put a major challenge on our today's production here at Airbus and as well on our supply chain. 
as we're having to cope with a very steep ramp up. And this is not only to satisfy our valued customers and to satisfy the demand that we have in our order books, but it is also in the very best interest of our environment and in, in the sake of decarbonization. Um, so therefore, we put all our efforts or a lot of our efforts really into enabling this very steep ramp up that lies ahead of us and, and constantly improving our production system to secure a smooth ramp up on one side, but also to ensure that our own production is meeting our sustainability expectations. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it in the next slide. In addition, we are, of course, in the, uh, in the current productions, we are also always seeking opportunities to introduce new technologies um, in order to make the aircraft more efficient and, again, with this, reduce fuel consumption and uh, reduce emissions, because this is all what it is about. So summed up, we at Airbus are looking at developing not only the aircraft, but also our industrial system, which is very, a very key enabler to satisfy the demand and the ramp-ups that we have. And we have to produce at high rates for that given, uh, given uh, reason. So what is the key drivers? Uh, it's a replacement of today's aircraft, which is obviously the quickest possible then to an airline to increase efficiency and become greener. Um, and the second point is really in, in terms of the increased demand and as time is ticking, uh, Airbus as an OEM together with our partners from industry and research uh, need to speed up our developments of the relevant technologies in order to enable a entry into market for a more sustainable aircraft. So it's both what we're addressing. Um, when you look at the right side of the slide, you will understand that when we're um, looking at the demand for the future, uh, the, the main focus, uh, three, three quarters uh, of the demand will be in the small um, sector. And for this reason, with our uh, zero E aircraft, we're addressing exactly this market and uh, when we want to uh, develop our aircraft. And as you probably know, entry into service is planned by 2035. It will address exactly the regional and the small uh, market in the future. So coming to the zero E uh, aircraft, um, here I would ju just like to give a quick demonstration of what we're talking about. Um, here you see three of our concept models. And I sometimes get the question uh, when we're showing different uh, pictures, which one is it now really? Um, very clearly, there's probably more than 100 concept planes that we have uh, currently uh, in our development. Um, and we have not yet decided how exactly it will look like. Therefore, this is only a, a wide selection of what could uh, it look like in the future. But currently, we're rather maturing the technologies. We call them technology bricks. Before, by 2026, 20, uh, roughly, we will decide which concept airplane it will actually be. But just to give you a flavor, uh, you see here three models. You see on the top uh, a turboprop model, and there's other ones. Uh, we have some where there's even three pots on each wing. Uh, here, you only see one rotor. But the, again, there's big variants of concept planes that we have today. Um, we have in the middle, you see the blended wing body. Uh, just to show that there's also very disruptive models that we have in our concept planes and the con concept studies. But I think you will not be surprised if I tell you that very unlikely it will be 2035. We're looking into such a model like this just from a certification standpoint. That will be really, really complex and take much longer. But it's just to say um, there is a long, uh, long term perspective also here because we will very sure also see an evolution of aircraft. Uh, beyond 2035. So this is part clearly of our concept planes as well. And then on the on the bottom, you see the turbofan, which looks very similar to our typical single aircraft that we have today. Um, as I said today, we're focusing on the what we call the technology bricks first to mature them. And just to mention a couple of the probably most famous ones, um, we have, for instance, the engine itself. So we're talking all of them of the aircraft here uh, will be fueled by hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, uh, indeed. So when we talk about uh, uh, the, the combustion, uh, we'll have to modify our engines uh, in order to allow them to be run on based on, on hydrogen. But we as well are um, developing a fuel cell. So we're looking to fuel cell technologies. Um, we're off, uh, because the fuel cell obviously has the advantage over the classic engine to really eliminate all uh, emissions uh, 
um, uh, there are besides CO2, but also we're looking into the noxious and contrails, which of course needs to be addressed as well. For this reason, we have uh, created a joint venture with Ellerin Klinger. It's called Aerostack, where we ourselves are together with Ellerin Klinger developing a fuel cell capable of that, this size of an aircraft. Huh? So in the, in the smaller regions we have seen, and we do see other developments as well, but in our, our in this region we're looking here in this uh, uh, size of an aircraft um, we are developing this in in, uh, in this joint venture with Aerostack together. Another very important um, uh, brick technology brick that we're looking into and that will determine a lot in the end also how the aircraft overall will look like is the tanks. Um, you must know for for liquid hydrogen. Um, the, the, it's much lighter than, than kerosene, which is good as we're in aviation and uh, there's a lot about the, the weight, but it unfortunately has four times the volume of kerosene and it is uh, to be stored in different conditions. For this reason, it will no longer be able to be stored in the wings as we have it today for our, our aircraft. Um, and we have to uh, ha develop tanks which have very good thermal management. Liquid hydrogen is um, uh, stored or is managed at a level of minus 253 degrees. And you can just imagine what that means uh, for the thermal management itself. Also the size I mentioned already. So there's a lot to be overcome in terms of challenges that we have technically. And this in the end will also have an influence on how all those individual in, uh, technology bricks will interact. And that will then finally in 26 uh, determine how the overall aircraft will look like. Um, besides the individual technology breaks, uh, what must be said at this point is also, we need to also look at the overall aircraft design, especially in terms of aerodynamics. Um, we need to also uh, find further efficiencies from the aircraft, from the fuselage, from the wings, um, as obviously it needs to be still affordable for passengers, for airlines to fly. Uh, and as uh, hydrogen has a higher cost than kerosene, we need to overcome that by finding other efficiencies uh, overall. So as you can see from the size and range of the zero E concepts here, they will first complement rather the currently operated fleets. So it's rather addressing a small uh, and re regional uh, uh, aircraft fleets basically. And then uh, later on, we'll probably also start replacing other sizes. Um, just, this slide is just to demonstrate it, you know, a little bit what it is in terms of a journey. Zero E as a journey with many variables that we have to be so, uh, that will have to be solved before the entry into service in 2035. You can see from this chart um, that there is already a lot being done on technology aspect impacts. Obviously, this is what we are very much focusing on today, but we're having to secure in the end also the aircraft ecosystem and infrastructure. For example, ensuring that the hydrogen supply is insured worldwide and also that we have uh, the, the infrastructure available. While the technology maturation is going uh, ongoing and, and will be ready by 26, as I said, to determine the best config configuration fit in the aircraft itself, um, we, we uh, will also at that point, so in 2026, have to be assured that the infrastructure and ecosystem for hydrogen will be ready worldwide at airports by the time of entry into service by 2035. So there is a key area of concern as of today. And as I always say, um, I'm not so worried about the technology. This is what we're good at. This is what our partners are good at. So this is what we have been doing all, all our lives, basically, uh, developing technologies that fly in the end in the aviation. But what is a little bit more uh, worrying from my perspective is really exactly this latter part, the ecosystem and, and infrastructure. There is a lot of very complex uh, circumstances that need to be considered. There is a lot of things like regulations and so on to be considered, and it will only be possible if we all work together. So this is an area where we need to act right now. And as I said, uh, we need to use the next couple of years to be really assured it can be ready by 2035. So how, what are we doing in that sense at, at Airbus? Um, uh, we, we believe, as I said, it's a very complex, um, uh, it's a very com complex uh, um, environment we're playing within, and we believe it needs to be facilitated. So we want to play sort of as a catalyst or, or a facilitator in that range. And just to explain you what we're doing, uh, this chart is really straight, and I will start on the top left uh, corner with the ecosystem partnership approach. Yeah? So we are establishing a global network with leading airlines, with 
energy providers, with infrastructure and airports, um, and also with uh, other sectors uh, in order to determine quickly how we can manage this overall challenge. We develop, in this sense, partnerships and projects in strategic regions with high market uh, potential, and we're preparing what we call hydrogen hubs at airports worldwide. Um, the same we address also in these partnerships, hydrogen infrastructure that needs to be secured also worldwide. So basically here, as I said, we're maneuvering in a very complex environment and we need all the support we can get and all of us need to play a role in this. On the upper right part, um, here is a demonstration of what we call the clusters. So here we have um, uh, created hydrogen energy launch clusters. Um, currently, we have identified based on a multitude of quantitative and qualitative factors, uh, 12 clusters worldwide. They're in the US, uh, they're in Asia Pacific, as well as the MENA region in Europe. Um, the, the criteria behind are, are diverse, uh, and there's a wide variety, but just to give you uh, 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 some, some impression of what it is, it's the addressable market, uh, the willingness of airlines in that region, um, as well as regulations for, and regulatory frameworks, political uh, setup, synergy potential also with other industries, and also political stability is, of course, a key, a key criteria. Um, and, and, and the last to mention, but probably the most important, the access to hydrogen in that specific region. Huh? Um, we have performed this very global analysis and we selected the, the clusters that we see here today. Um, this may be subject to change. Uh, it's not necessarily limited to those clusters, but those are the clusters we're starting with. Um, now I need to see, yeah, uh, it's, I'll just uh, get over with the um, animation. On the bottom right hand corner, uh, you, you see one of the key questions we have to ask ourselves in this, it's centralization versus decentralization. And of course, I think you will not be surprised to say it will be a mix and it will very much depend on the region. So it will not be one, uh, one, uh, one setup that will fit all but it will have to really individually looked at. And we have always to decide, is it, uh, um, is it rather uh, one hydrogen uh, production and distribution center, for instance, for Europe, or is it uh, decentralized uh, different uh, um, uh, distribution circles? Um, it looks at different uh, activities in the hydrogen uh, life cycle as well. So we're looking into the power generation, of course, which is key as an input the electrolysis uh, for, of hydrogen itself, but as well for the distribution and the very local distributions. Um, it's very complex scenarios. And as I said, it always depends on the regional setup itself, what is the best fit. And that is what makes it very, will make it very complex and lengthy. And that's why we need to really speed up here in order to win, uh, win, win speed uh, over time. Huh? Um, on the bottom, uh, Left-hand corner, just to finish, is what we call a hydrogen hub. So this is what a hydrogen hub, in the end, uh, is composed of. And there's different pictures. There's even some with uh, hydrogen plants right next to, to an airport, which is a potential solution in, in some uh, regions, whereas others uh, will not be able to have a hydrogen um, uh, uh, production center right next to the airport. Um, it's the, the key point here is it needs to overlook all the disciplines and all needs to come together. It needs to be a holistic approach, um, also from an airport infrastructure uh, standpoint, but as well, we need to look into regulations and standards that need to be developed for the handling uh, of hydrogen at airports. Um, and in the end, uh, all this needs to play together in time, as I said, and just this to be memorized, by 26, we need to be really sure that all of this will be in place worldwide by 35, because you will uh, you will understand that we will not bring an aircraft onto market. We will not develop a zero E program if we're not assured we can operate it or the airlines can operate it uh, eventually worldwide. So we talked a lot about hydrogen um, in the previous slides. Obviously, that's the matter of choice uh, um, for us for the future of green flying uh, long term, simply because it really, if we talk about net zero, so zero emissions, that's the only choice that we have in aviation uh, and, and 
preferably uh, mentioned already the fuel cell um, because that also eliminates the emissions of NOx uh, and, and uh, contrails. Um, but there's also, uh, and, and hyd uh, hydrogen combustion, I also explained that's another alternative we have for our zero E aircraft uh, in, in order to uh, burn the hydrogen and, and then uh, to, to create uh, the, um, to, to fly uh, by combustion, by classic combustion. But there is also another alternative that can be addressable today based on hydrogen. And this is uh, not enough uh, spoken about, I believe, as of today, because I still get a lot of questions when people ask me, so what is it now for Airbus? Is it hydrogen or is it sustainable aviation fuel, SAF? And in the end, if we look at it, and this is to illustrate in this part, SAF, at least if we look into power to liquid, is also hydrogen based. So it's not either or, but in the end, it's all about hydrogen um, that comes together. And that is addressable as of today. So with immediate effect, we could create um, power to liquid. Um, so similar aviation fuel based on, on hydrogen, we could use it immediately in our aircraft as of today. Um, this is a, a major undertaking in terms of infrastructure. Unfortunately, very little is available as of today. There is more and more um, uh, projects being launched. I'm very excited about it. I'm I'm observing a lot the market. We we have cooperations also in this field. We personally, Airbus is engaging also in this as we believe it's the best solution. Um, for the existing fleets, remember that we will have for very, very long also existing fleets flying. Um, so we need to address also those in terms of reduction of emissions as of today. So that's one part, uh, how to create sustainable aviation fuels. And that perfectly hands over to the uh, sector of sustainable aviation fuels. And as I said, it's not either or. Long term, in terms of net zero, it's hydrogen-based uh, aircraft or flying for the small uh, and medium-sized uh, aircraft at least. Um, but for the rest of the existing fleets, as well as for a long uh, distance transportation, uh, it will for very long have to be uh, a rather classic aircraft um, where then they should be fueled by sustainable aviation fuels. Why long distance aircraft? I didn't mention that early in our concept plane slide, but if you think about what I said about the tanks, four times the size, that will be quite a challenge for a big aircraft. So we, will, we very likely will see for very long, rather classic aircraft in this sector. So while I talked a lot about the power to liquid or a little bit about the power to liquid ZAF uh, based on, uh, on hydrogen, we need to acknowledge that there's very little up to pretty much none available as of today. So today what we see when talking about ZAF is mainly biomass bath. So it's renewable raw materials and various wastes and resi uh, residues are currently the most common raw materials for ZAF. It's used fats, oils and greases, um, as well as municipal waste um, and also some, some uh, forestry waste and, and residues as well. Um, the biomass uh, ZAF is reducing CO2 emissions by up to 85%, and this is quite some. So that's why I'm saying this is what's existing already today. We don't have to wait to 2035 in order to uh, get this going. It's a so-called drop-in fuel, and as such, it's, the handling is very easy as it can be mixed with uh, traditional kerosene uh, by the operators. And just to, to drop some figures, since 2011, that's how long we're experiencing with uh, SAF powered flights, more than 350,000 flights have been uh, performed. Um, but as to not disturb global food supplies, which is always a discussion that we're having as well, uh, and rightfully a discussion, and to compensate for the huge upcoming demand, we at Airbus clearly see the demand for large production facilities of the rather H2-based, so hydrogen-based power to liquid stuff that I mentioned in the previous page. This being the reason why we are also engaging in this subject, and as we see the need to urgently accelerate their production and industrialization. So here's a couple more facts and figures about uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Airbus aircraft, all aircraft worldwide flying today are capable and uh, certified to fly by up to 50% ZAF. So immediately every single aircraft could be operated with half of the fuel coming from ZAF with no technical adaptation required. And we're targeting the certification of 100% ZAF by 2030. 
Unfortunately, the downside is less than only 1% of overall jet fuel demand is available as SIF today. So that's really the downside. And due to its low production rates and its cost um, are very high. Uh, they're currently almost three times uh, as high as the fossil fuels. So we need to really accelerate the production and as well the scalability in order to bring the prices down and make it more affordable. This is why we're taking at Airbus actions to develop stuff. And uh, we have done this already for a very, very long time. Um, we're promoting and pushing for a global ZAF user trade by 2030 for at least 10%. Today, the European Union has set the requirements for a ZAF rate of 7%. We believe it needs to be much higher in order to accelerate really the decarbonization. And just to give you an example, for this reason here in Germany, and part of the board, we have decided to double our soft consumption for the internal flights and we're targeting, targeting a 10% quote already as of this year and next year to come in order just to set an example that it can be done and it needs to be done in order to start uh, accelerating the production. As for our internal flights, the roadmap is very ambitious and we want by, for, for Airbus, we have set the target that by 2030, we will fly even 30% off land by 2050, uh, by, by, by 2030. So we'll do three times as high as we're promoting for the rest of EU, which should be a reasonable target. P keep in mind that ZAF is an enormous driver in reducing the emissions in the aviation industry. And most importantly, it is available today and we need to accelerate the, um, the consumption. Um, before leaving you with a brief summary of the main points of today, I first would like to thank you for the opportunity you haven't spoken today. And what I would like to summarize is EBS is developing a hydrogen plane until uh, 2035. It will come on the market. It's the only solution towards a truly sustainable future. And until then, uh, we shall be active. We shall look also into alternatives that we can immediately implement. And there are many solutions and ways out there to decarbonize aviation today. SAF is a very good uh, example that I've given here, but there's much, much more we can do and we have to do uh, because all elements in the end will uh, contribute to the overall target. Air traffic management being just one example and many other operations that can be run much more uh, efficiently. And this way, uh, I would like to come to the end of my speech. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, Ms. Dreher Langlet, for your great presentation. Um, I'm very interested in the point if uh, it will be possible up until 2035 to set up this global um, network of uh, uh, SAF um, referment, because I think that this might be the most uh, crucial uh, point of all the project. But um, yeah, we, we will see, and I think that uh, the, um, further questions will uh, be coming from the uh, participants. At this point, I would like to um, make uh, a short, a quite a quick su uh, suggestion. If you have any questions, please, please write them down in the chat. We will uh, um, collect them and then um, send them to the uh, to our participants, to our speakers uh, at the end in the Q and A round. So uh, please feel really free to write down your questions and uh, my colleague, Ms. Kara Kulak, will then collect them. Uh, said that, thank you a lot uh, again, Mr. Langlet, for your uh, excellent uh, input. And uh, I would like to welcome Mr. Jason Sutcliffe from uh, EMEA Rolls-Royce. Um, he is the Regional Marketing Director of EMEA Rolls-Royce currently on the Reunion Islands. So uh, thanks a lot for <laughs> joining us from that uh, very far and distant place. Um, he is on the uh, moving to um, Madagascar, as far as I know. So uh, without uh, any further ado, I would like to give him the floor. Um, uh, Mr. Sutcliffe, please feel free to uh, take over. Unfortunately, we cannot hear you, Mr. Sutcliffe. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, great. Let me just set up again. Right. Absolutely, absolutely no problem. We have no hurry. Right, I think we um, are good to go. Oh, 
my camera on. Just a quick question, is your camera on? Because we can hear you right now, but we cannot see you. Yeah, my camera is on, you should okay. have it up now. Yes, now we can see you, perfect. Okay. Everything is working. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Sutcliffe, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you all. Um, so today, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of um, Rolls-Royce's vision of the future um, and where we see maybe I'm not sorry I'm having a bit of trouble to uh... apologies the screen is not sharing. Absolutely no problem. I would like then to share it for your um, for your instance. Okay, I, it's okay. I'm. Let me try again. Are we here? Yes, now it works. Yeah, okay. Great. Yeah. So we'll start again. Um, I'm just going to take you through a quick. Uh, view of Rolls Royce's vision um, of a sustainable future, how we see the, um, I guess, the push to 2050 for a carbon neutral, sustainable world. Well, let's start at the beginning. Um, let's see where we are today and then, and then where we look to go to the future. So, from an aviation perspective, um, we generate nearly three trillion dollars a year globally nearly 35 percent of world's trade is transported by air and nearly 65 million jobs are supported by aviation worldwide and if ranked as a country we'd be 20th in the world which is amazing and i think we need to emphasize we have always been seen as the bad guys aviation's bad it's not co2s are bad Aviation is good. The enemy is CO2s. We provide transportation for food, plants and goods. We saw through COVID nearly all of the, um, the vaccines were transported by air. That wouldn't have happened without aviation. We bring people together. We connect people. We promote culture and understanding across the world. Aviation is ever so important to the world. And you think about where we've come from. So this is a picture of the Vickers Vimy aircraft. This is the uh, first aircraft that Rolls-Royce powered um, in, I think, 1906. And this aircraft would fly in approximately 35,000 miles, thinking miles, not cycles or hours here, but miles in between overhauls. Now, if you think of where we've come from and where we've got to today, the Trent XWB on the A350 will fly in the region of 10 million miles before being removed off wing for overhaul. Truly remarkable. Um, and we continue to evolve this industry that we're all engaged in. So what does the future look like? It's a massive challenge for us. We have ever growing demands. We, we saw before 2% of CO2s uh, provided by aviation. Um, we believe at Rolls-Royce that we have a very important part to play in the decarbonisation of not just aviation, but in some respects, power as well. So our business consists of civil aerospace, which includes wide body aircraft, business aviation, and some region jets as well, power systems, and also defence. Each one of these will look to be decarbonized over the coming years. In terms of the approach we're going to take, reducing fuel consumption of our existing products, reducing fuel consumption emissions and noise. If I look back about three or four years ago, I'd go and see a customer 
and we talk about the fuel efficiency of our aircraft and how much money it could save them. Because really at the time, that's all the airlines were thinking about, a reduction in cost. But actually, a reduction in fuel burn, which is also cost, but it has a direct correlation to a reduction in CO2s. And I'm finding myself more and more, especially in Europe, Middle East and Africa, customers asking me what the sustainability credentials are of our aircraft, not just the financial. Developing low carbon technologies and capabilities, and then also operationally Rolls-Royce, as Airbus mentioned, will be carbon neutral at all our facilities by 2030. So today's aircraft emit 80% less CO2s per passenger kilometer and it's 75% quieter. That's predominantly down to the engine technology. Um, the engines, for example, a Trent 700, 26, 27 year old aircraft was bypass ratio of five to one. Today, the engine's around 10, 11 to one. In the future, if we're looking at 15, 16, 17 to one. But ultimately, reliability, efficiency, and safety are all up. Emissions, fuel, and noise have all been reduced massively. So we're not the bad guys. Honestly, we've come a long way. We know we have a long way to go. Um, but we are portrayed, I think, in this world wrongly at times. But what can Rolls-Royce do to support this? So continue to evolve the gas turbine engine, collaborate on dropping sustainable aviation fuels and develop radical alternatives such as electrification and hydrogen, all underpinned importantly by manufacturing processes, digital services. I think digital and the infrastructure will have a huge, um, I guess, point to play in the um, decarbonisation going forward. So today um, we have the Ultrafan demonstration engine, which is on the test bed in the UK. Um, this is a real engine. Uh, the gear, it's a reduction gearbox with multiple new technologies, as you can see there. I won't go into the detail. I know we're short on time, um, but these technologies will improve performance um, and improve on today's engines by about 10 percent on fuel burn, or should I say SFC. Um, and often the direct correlation potentially with SFC to fuel burn once the engines is sold on the aircraft. So as you can see here from our point zero, which is the Trent 700, a 26, 27 year old engine, all the way down to the Ultrafan, there's a 25% improvement in the SFC, which we believe that going forward, we can improve on that on by 1% per year using technology and technology insertion. Also, all our Trent engines are recyclable. Up to 98% of the engine can now be recycled, um, whether that goes back into aerospace or into other materials, such as uh, material for cars, golf clubs, etc. But there is capability and the engines are nearly 100% recyclable. Next, we talk about collaboration of sustainable aviation fuels. Today, 0.1% of global jet fuel is SAF. We're going to need nearly 500 million tonnes of sustainable aviation fuel by 2050 if we are to meet the industry goals. Now, I think we spoke about this earlier, so I won't dwell on what sustainable aviation fuel is, um, but other ways of, ca of capturing um, SAF is di through direct carbon, sorry, direct air capture, um, the use of CO2s and carbon capture storage and utilization um, and technologies that have evolved, you know, in order to make, for example, the hydrogen as well. Um, I'll come on to our nuclear um, support that could really help this going forward shortly. But I think there's multiple ways that we can reach our goals. The key thing is, as mentioned before, dropping SAF is required. Today, you can fly any aircraft on a 50% SAF solution blend. Going forward, we're looking to improve that to 100%. Um, and we will help the airframers get to reach those goals. The challenges we have are cost, scalability and distribution, um, manufacturing capability, policies and incentives. So governments 
need to come to the forefront and help us achieve this. We can't do it on our own. We need to collaborate. From Rolls-Royce perspective, we have our ultrafan demonstration aircraft. We have a flying test bed that runs on sustainable aviation fuel. 10% of all our development engines and engine pass-offs will be on a 10% minimum blend of SAF. It's not just civil airspace. The military, the MRTT aircraft, are looking to fly with sustainable aviation fuels. We've also developed a service for our business aviation um, fraternity called Safinity, whereby um, BizAv can purchase a percentage of sustainable aviation fuel as part of their service contracts. And then working on eCliff with um, Airbus to get the A350 uh, running on 100% SAF and also um, understanding the, um, the particulars on, on how we can get to certify those aircraft at 100% SAF because it's not just not that easy as putting the fuel in or dropping like it is on a, um, an engine. You've got to think about the um, aromatic value, the viscosity of the fuel and things like that and their effects on the fuel tanks and the O-ring seals. So a lot more work to be done by the airframers than the engine OEMs. I'll come on to the SMRs shortly. So within Rolls-Royce in our defence system, we've been powering the Royal Navy's nuclear submarines for many, many years. So we've honed that nuclear technology. What that has enabled us to do is support the manufacture of small modular nuclear reactors. As you can see here, the reactor can power a million homes, cool 500,000 households, but potentially produce through carbon capture 280 tonnes per day of sustainable aviation fuel, completely green fuel, and produce up to 170 tonnes of hydrogen. I think this, again, will be an enabler for us to get where we need to be in 2050. And finally, developing radical alternatives such as electrification and hydrogen. So we have hydrogen, electric, and we saw the future contracts from Airbus on their, their e-aircraft. Where we believe at Rolls-Royce we can support, um, starting off at urban air mobility with the EV tolls, we believe an all-electric craft is possible given the range that they're looking to do. We've had a recent collaboration with um, Hyundai that's produced, um, I, I guess, a good collaboration on battery and battery life. Moving up the field, small turboprops commute up to regional gas turbines and combusting kerosene with SAF and battery. More electric gas turbine aircraft for your narrow body and wide body aircraft. Hydrogen fuel cells up to regional then gas turbines with hydrogen fuel cells or combustion fuel cells, all underpinned by dropping sustainable aviation fuel. We mentioned earlier that hydrogen at a glance is, is fantastic. It emits water and um, derives from many sources, um, easy for transportation and can be carried um, and be able to deliver the, the energy to the, um, the facilities that it's required at. It comes potentially with some challenges and considerations. The jury, I think, is still out on contrails and vapour. Um, I think a lot more investigation needs to go on there. Um, it's three times the density, um, the energy density of kerosene, but it, the volume is four times that of kerosene. So there's a lot of, as you can see, the bulbous aircraft that you see here, the concept aircraft will be massively different to what we see today. Um, it requires um, specialist pressurized storage tanks and again, a complex thermal management system. But I'm sure that we'll overcome these. In the electrical um, arm, I guess you have small propeller aircraft for the 300 kilowatt batteries, EV tolls looking one to four, maybe five um, people to carry. We're working massively with vertical airspace and also with um, Embraer with EVE they're going to need a sort of one megawatt class um, motor. And then commuter-wise with Technum, the P-Volt working in conjunction with Widrow, um, a two megawatt motor to power the, um, the P-Volt. Expected the AS for EV tolls 24, 25. The P-Volt 20, 2026, probably up to nine, 10 passengers, um, all electric. Um, for the small term. As, as I mentioned before, 
we don't envisage a modern wide body aircraft to be all electric in the near future. We recently last year tested um, Axel, which is a demonstrator of our electrical capability. So the world's fastest electric aircraft, um, world's fastest to for speed and climb and descent, which is um, a great achievement by the team. I think also with our power systems team, we can look at um, wind um, to battery and solar to battery power. We're, we're using and developed our battery story systems, um, which can be de deployed um, whether in the field or remotely on, on islands um, or even at airports. As you can see here, going forward, we expect the EV VTOL business to really take off initially. Um, and we can provide the infrastructure and the power for that infrastructure um, for these remote vertiports using renewable energy and hydrogen fuel cells, battery chargers and fast chargers for not only the EV tolls, but for the small commuter aircraft as well. But to summarize, embrace aviation. Aviation is a force for good. It's CO2s we need to combat and we can do that together. We can do that by collaborating and the industry needs to meet those de uh, demands in sustainability and develop technical solutions to enable us to in get to carbon net zero by 2050. And that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you a lot, Mr. Sutcliffe. Um, indeed, very interesting uh, insights into the um, various development strengths that uh, also Ross Royce is um, trying to pursue. So, um, what me personally um, really um, what struck me was the um, also the, the, the development on atom uh, atomic craft, so a nuclear power plants. That, that was quite interesting and indeed. Um, Thinking a little bit outside the box, I would say, uh, also for this kind of um, aviation in, uh, for this industry. So, uh, well, if, if you think about the the um, SMR, it's an enabler to produce completely green SAF and hydrogen and carbon capture. So that for our industry is going to be very important if we need to scale up to the amounts that we need by 2050. And that's a key part about it. Absolutely nothing to say uh, contrary to that. <laughs> um, one uh, last uh, thing, Mr. Sutcliffe, I'm, uh, I know that you cannot remain up until the end um, for the Q&A round. So um, at this point, thank you a lot for joining us today and for you. your uh, very precious uh, contribution. Um, we are very looking forward to uh, meeting up again in the uh, near future and um, we wish you all the best uh, for your travel now to Madagascar. So uh, thank you a lot you. and for your great contribution. Thanks for your time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Satkiv. Uh, moving on to our next uh, speaker, uh, we will uh, now switch from uh, producer up to the ones who are consuming um, aircrafts or um, the uh, propulsion systems. So we are moving to uh, KLM Air France and Mr. Paul Chun, uh, the Vice President en Engine Services, with his presentation. So, Mr. Paul Chun, uh, please feel free to uh, take over the um, um, the floor. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Robert. Um, just to make one uh, correction, I'm currently not the vice president of instant services. I've been doing that for eight years. Currently, I'm uh, uh, the vice president for technology hub, as we call it. Um, so, from that perspective, I want to share uh, something with you uh, all. Thank you of for having me here today. And thank you for the two excellent presentations from uh, the major OEMs in, uh, in the aviation uh, industry. Let's see if I can share something. Start again. Can you see it, uh, my presentation? Or? Unfortunately not. Yeah. Okay. 
maybe Robert, because we're running out of time. Absolutely. Yeah, I am. I'm just going to open it. Uh, okay. Here it is. So I am going to share. Here it is. So I do believe that you should all see the presentation right now. I'm going to shut myself out. And uh, Mr. Chun, <clears throat> just give me, please, a brief um, information yeah. when I need to switch the page. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. So uh, it's a good tradition in aviation to have a backup system. So we go now for the backup of my presentation. Um, yeah, regarding the theme of to, uh, today's uh, conference, uh, um, uh, survival of the greenest. I want to share with you, uh, say, the airline perspective, and also, um, as we have at uh, Air France KLM, also uh, a great uh, maintenance division, also the, um, the perspective from a maintenance point of view. If you look to uh, survival of uh, uh, the greenest, which is a variant of survival of the fittest, I think we can learn from Darwin that to have the ultimate solution, whether it's uh, wings or uh, feathers or whatever, is not the whole part of the game. Evolution and uh, migration to the end solution is as important as the end solution it is. So we learned from, um, uh, from Airbus uh, uh, some nice things uh, which we can uh, uh, embrace uh, as an industry and from Rolls Royce, I'm very excited that we might have atomic uh, uh, fueled uh, uh, airplanes. But today's uh, reality is also that as an airline, we have to cope with, and if you can click uh, Robert now to the next slide, we have to cope with something which is called uh, uh, flight chain. And that has the developed in society um, actually, it's the position of uh, aviation uh, in society. Um, and as uh, uh, Mr. Shetcliffe said, that um, uh, aviation or uh, aviation industry, we are not the get bad guys. I fully support that. But the question is, how can we get as an industry, uh, as we all understand in aviation, a license to operate which is acceptable by, uh, by society. And industry is going to a roller coast at uh, this moment. Uh, on the left side, you see what happened in 2020 uh, to the industry, uh, grounded airplanes, no passengers. And sorry to have uh, a little fault, the 2020 to the right, it's actually 2022, which we currently have uh, major air, airports collected um, a lot of debate about aviation and how much it's consuming. Um, so my point is that we have to cope with, uh, uh, with the position of aviation in society. And of course, it's good that we have uh, um, uh, ultimate solutions like hydrogen, uh, but we have to also migrate to that. Uh, so maybe the next slide. Uh, well, we all know that uh, there's a, a lot of growing social pressure uh, on uh, uh, the CUT, but also uh, auto emission from, from aviation. And the debate is, um, if it is uh, for society uh, bearable to have aviation developed as it has been developing in the past uh, decades. So I don't... Uh, uh, and, in the mind uh, the, the figures of Airbus, but I think if we don't realize that we have also uh, a position in society that survival of the gre uh, greenest, um, some of us won't be there. And the, the question is, how do we uh, migrate from today's situation and uh, show everybody that we are working on uh, on a green aviation and a green airline and green, in green industry? Um, so that we are, will be allowed to have enough time to uh, wait for the ultimate solution in uh, 2035 or 2040. 
So the next slide, please. If you look to KLM, uh, the way we, do, we did it is that we put uh, sustainability in the core of our purpose. Our purpose uh, has changed as an airline uh, to what we now call pioneering uh, a sustainable aviation. And that brings us that we have to have three major themes uh, or spearheads, as you can call them. First, we want to run a, a great airline for our customers. And that's not only to transfer passengers from A to B or to have them uh, travel in nice seats or to have the best catering. That's also to address their concern about uh, the, uh, the effect on climate and uh, what flight is doing uh, with that. The other a pillar on it is that we want to transfer as a company to the net positive uh, company. That means in all aspects, uh, not only uh, the CO2 uh, emission, but also the way we uh, we handle our passengers, the, also the way we uh, we have the whole process uh, uh, in control also until uh, the, the drinks and uh, the nice catering on board. To do that, we have to uh, create a technology advantage, use technology which is available or will be uh, available uh, in the nearby future. So that's why I listen with great interest to um, uh, the things, uh, uh, the, the people, the presentation from uh, uh, Airbus and Rolls-Royce. You can put the next slide on. This is our part to uh, the climate goals, which is a uh, risk of zero emission in 2050. Currently, uh, and I'm sure that uh, my fellow presenter from Airbus uh, can uh, support that, uh, we are renewing our fleet to get at this moment the most efficient, uh, less fuel, less uh, emission, and quiet airplane, airplanes. We did that within uh, Airplane scale M is our uh, uh, medium uh, range uh, airplanes, which we are uh, replaced by, by Airbus uh, 320s. Uh, uh, the other options, and I'm very, very glad that uh, there was so much talk about the sustainable aviation fuel, uh, because in today's discussion, a lot of the political discussions, the environmentalist discussions, are about hydrogen, are about electrical flying, um, but nobody's talking about how we survive the coming 15 years. And this sustainable aviation fuel discussion should be supported by the industry to a higher level, uh, even political level, because it has to do with uh, choices. As was mentioned, uh, it, to produce uh, synthetic sustainable uh, fuel, um, and I'm not talking about biofuels, means that as a society, we have to uh, make choices that part of our available uh, energy should go to transformation of, uh, 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 to make this uh, uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, and in today's debate, um, I'm hardly hearing something about, uh, about use of glad of self, and I'm glad that uh, at least two of the, the major OEMs are now mentioning it in, in this platform. But the, the, the sound about CEFs should be much, much more louder. The other thing is beneath it, technology uh, development. And that's also of importance. And I want to share the next uh, page with you. If you look here to... Uh, you don't have to read everything, but the orange statements uh, will help. If you look to hydrogen, that's a, a solution, as was mentioned, which will occur in 10 years plus and cost a lot of money. Also in migration to that uh, point. If you look to batteries, uh, although it is a, something which is very appealing to the general public because of the success of uh, electrical cars. Um, as long as we don't uh, solve the energy uh, weight 
density, um, it will not be a solution for the, uh, the medium and long range uh, airplanes. The question is, if all the electrical flights uh, are, or uh, vehicles, the electrical aircrafts which are introduced now are uh, not a different uh, new market. Uh, and if it might also be, if you are talking about congested airports, uh, maybe become a problem uh, uh, for the current airlines. So there's a question mark there. And then uh, there has been a lot of uh, uh, slides uh, explained about, uh, uh, about SAF. Um, that really helps in the intermediate period until there is a, a fully hydrogen or hydrogen liquid uh, uh, plane available. So the next slide, please. If you look to, this is a slide which comes from uh, Destination 2050, which is an, a report from the European Com uh, Commission. Um, and now I just want to point out that in the 2050 uh, playbook, there is a, a significant part of the, uh, the reduction compared to the development uh, to our current level is the effect of sustainable aviation fuel, but also the improvements of today's technology. And from an airline and an uh, airline maintenance organization, we should not forget these two uh, elements uh, in the 2050 playbook. And sure, I embrace all the, the efforts and uh, as a technician, I'm very excited what's happening on the, the field of uh, hydrogen planes but don't forget that we have to develop our current uh, uh, system uh, also. And it was slightly mentioned um, that we have to look to different things uh, than only uh, the airplane or its engines. We have to learn uh, to see if uh, technology can help us to have uh, smarter uh, air traffic, but also uh, reduce uh, the uh, the use of fuel for taxiing or for other uh, ground operations. Uh, that will help to show to the public that as uh, an airline industry or as an aviation industry, we take the, uh, the effects on the, on the environment seriously uh, and that we also st uh, are not shy of uh, starting with small steps, although we have a, a bigger plan uh, being the hydrogen variant of, uh, of airplanes. So the next slide, please. So what we have to think about is um, if you look to the figures and the strategy uh, in aviation has been almost more and more and more. Um, in the meantime, to survive and to be survival of the greenest, we have to uh, think about today's technology and how we can uh, evolve to tomorrow's uh, technology and show that to the uh, to society so that we get a better acceptance of aviation um, so that we can be survival of the greens. Thank you for your attention. This is, you know, those are backup sets, so I don't need For your attention, this was what I had to share with you. Um, I hope, Robert, that I gained some time with you for you. Thank you, Mr. Chun. Um, I think that the um, thinking of uh, comprehend also uh, today's technology into the net zero emission and see how we could improve um, what the state currently is, uh, is also very important for our future outlook. So uh, these are also um, things that need to be um, taken into account while talking about long perspective um, strategy. So um, I think that these are exactly the current the most appropriate uh, thinkings that we have on um, the future outlook. So thank you a lot, uh, Mr. Chun, about, uh, for your input. If there are any questions to Mr. Chun, please, uh, again, uh, put them into uh, the chat. Uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Kulak, is um, collecting them, and we will uh, then uh, redirect them to our speakers at the end of uh, this panel. 
The panel, which will now be closed by uh, Mr. Ali Uzun, the General, General Council, uh, Council and Sustainability Director from Pegasus Airlines. Um, thank you a lot for being here today, uh, Mr. Uzun. Um, it's the last um, speaker that we have for this first panel. We will then um, immediately, directly afterwards, go into the Q&A session and uh, have a very short break and then go to panel two, which will uh, start at around about 11.10, 11.15, after this uh, painting closes. So, Mr. Uh, Uzun, um, the floor is yours. Um, please, um, you have free possibility to share your screen. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, yeah, before sharing my screen, I just want to say hi to uh, every attendee. Uh, I'm uh, also a native of Izmir, and I'm very happy uh, that my hometown is co-hosting this uh, event online. So uh, very quickly, I only have four slides. Uh, we've touched upon some of the uh, issues by previous speakers. Uh, so I won't spend too much time on similar themes. Uh, but I, what we'll do is maybe we'll just readjust our focus. We'll zoom in, zoom out, and then uh, uh, restart from where we left. I just want to take you through uh, the wider context of, uh, again, zooming out, the wider context of uh, total greenhouse gas emissions, uh, transportation as a share of around 14%. Of course, depending on the source, the numbers may you know, change one or two percentage points, but more or less it's the same. And then on the right-hand side, you see a graph that shows a breakdown of the transportation greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Obviously, aviation um, is much smaller compared to road transport, but uh, still consumes a, a significant share. Now, within that smaller share of aviation, the airlines have a wider impact because we've, you know, today listened from uh, Airbus, from Rolls-Royce, but um, through the operations and the consumption of the jet fuel, more than 90% of total aviation greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions um, under, are under the responsibility of airlines. So uh, I think that's where we come in, uh, as Paul also uh, very ac accurately mentioned. So looking at the overall picture, uh, air airlines across the world uh, are strongly committed to uh, net zero operations, carbon neutrality by 2050, generally speaking. You see a bunch of commitments and airlines here, but the, the list this screen is not uh, is not exhaustive. For example, KLM, uh, Paul just gave a presentation. They also have a 2050 net zero commitment. On top of that, they're actually uh, working on a size-based uh, targets initiative. So uh, we can say that uh, airlines are have, have publicly made a promise to the public that um, that they'll become uh, carbon neutral uh, by 2050. Now, the biggest question is how that's going to happen because nobody really knows uh, the question beyond a theoretical uh, possibility. Again, uh, I just want to underline, this may be rudimentary for most of the attendees, but I'll still make the point. Uh, at the bottom of the page, you see this evolution of uh, SAF in numbers uh, since 2016 and it gives a projection for 2025. This is IATA figures. Uh, so basically, SAF is something that's been in use for over six years now. So uh, this year, it's been used in almost half a million flights. Uh, there's a strong increase, but in the overall, it's still a very, very small proportion of the entire jet fuel burn. Uh, so it's going to there's, there's a huge demand for SAF going forward, but that's one of the difficulties I'll, I'll mention in just a second. I just want to spend a minute here um, on the uh, pie chart you see on the top right-hand side. Uh, again, you see different variations of these from different sources. I like to stick with IATA's pie chart. This I think this was the first to come out, uh, but it's about a year old now, so maybe a slight... Uh, adjustments may be necessary. 
you see that in our path to net zero operations in 2050, the biggest chunk comes from sustainable aviation fuels. The technology uh, provides a contribution of around 15%, partly because it's going to come in at a later stage. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty about that. Another striking point is all the efficiency we're contemplating, more direct flight paths, um, use of better turnaround times, um, more optimized operations, and not not all of this is entirely under the airline's control because there's a lot of stake up, stakeholders involved. But all of that combined uh, provides only a three percent of uh, of of the roadmap. So uh, I think that uh, says a lot about the importance of the use of SAF. And then. Uh, this is, I think, the uh, new information that we haven't discussed before. Uh, so SAF is not science fiction, but there's there are significant challenges uh, laying ahead. The chart on the left-hand side um, shows an overview of SAF production across the globe. So the orange uh, development facilities are currently active, and the blue ones are planned to... Um, become active in the coming years. Uh, as you can see, currently we don't have the necessary supply. Uh, so there's a lot of ifs and buts uh, going forward. Right now, uh, for a lot of airlines, uh, SAF is something with an extremely higher cost margin and uh, lack of availability. Another, cost, another difficulty that uh, we face uh, when trying to plan ahead is the regulatory challenges. Uh, I'll just mention three specific uh, challenges here. Uh, first of all, let me start with the EU-wide challenge. This doesn't only apply to EU, it applies to a lot of uh, national borders, including Turkey. There's, there's also an SAF mandate that's under discussion right now. So regulators are planning on imposing uh, fuel uptake um, obligations for airlines, uh, starting from 1% or 2% of their annual jet fuel consumption up to 5% talking about the EU plan. But then uh, when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about UK, uh, other um, uh, nations, uh, this requirement may go up to uh, higher levels. Uh, so this brings another issue of purchasing fuel at a specific destination with certain um, blend of SAF. Uh, so SAF is more expensive than jet fuel, obviously, but then this um, requirement for purchase of SAF at different operational hubs uh, brings an additional marginal cost on airlines, which we have to face, uh, manage, convince regulators, convince stakeholders to be involved. It's a big economic uh, issue laying ahead. The two other examples... Um, unfortunately, they're becoming very typical, uh, and I have to say, the SAF mandate, uh, the logic is um, easier to understand for airlines, but for example, a uh, ban of certain uh, flights, uh, channelizing consumers to different transportation modes, uh, this is something in place in France that we see right now, uh, so um, shorter haul, Domestic flights are certainly uh, operators cannot provide these uh, flights. So it's a direct intervention on uh, the carrier's operations. Uh, the other example we see, well, Portugal's up here, but it's also in place in several uh, other countries. Uh, it's simply an additional carbon tax, uh, which is a supplement to the airfare. So eventually, uh, to the extent possible, this is reflected on the consumers, just like airport tax. Uh, so direct taxation uh, actually acts as a um, deterrent factor for consumers to uh, choose uh, flights uh, above all the other transportation authorities. But obviously for um, flights between or like traveling between different countries, etc., uh, most of the time, uh, you wouldn't have a lot of alternatives 
maybe not for domestic flights, but uh, for international flights uh, at least. So um, this is broadly our perspective from an airline's perspective, the road to 2050. Uh, we see the challenges, we understand the difficulty. Uh, we're currently working extremely hard uh, to basically uh, fill in the gaps between now and 2050, uh, how we can set midterm targets uh, to prove to the public that we'll be able to live up to our promises for 2050. And when we're doing that, we're trying to plan ahead uh, enter into uh, clusters of partnerships, developments, research areas, and uh, forward purchase agreements going forward uh, to the extent we can. So there is a lot of discussion, uh, research, uh, and collaboration going on. But uh, it, I can certainly say that uh, much more collaboration is necessary, especially on the part of regulators, uh, considering the uh internationality the international aspect of uh aviation so that will be my presentation for today uh maybe a little short but i, I just didn't want to repeat most of the things that were already covered uh, happy to answer any questions you may have Thank you a lot, Mr. Wizen, um, for your presentation. Even if it was short, I think that uh, you may have maybe something to say afterwards in the Q&A uh, session, so to give um, maybe a little bit more input from, from Pegasus side also. Uh, so thank you a lot for joining us today and for your uh, great uh, input. I would like to thanks again, um, thank again all of the um, keynote speakers up until this point. Uh, thank you for um, your great input that you gave us. And I think that uh, you have also uh, generated some questions in the audience. Um, I have um, collected some of them, and which I would like to um, to directly uh, redirect to to US speakers. So uh, maybe um, I would like to start directly with Miss Adra Langlet, which was our first uh, speaker today, uh, because the question of the audience was uh, that a tour prop aircraft is completely outside the product line and strategy of Airbus. How will this fit in the, uh, with the current strategy of single aisle, single aisle and twin aisle products? Um, Mr. Langlet, if you would uh, eventually um, talk something about this topic and then cover also um, the topic that uh, of dec decarbonization, which you, uh, with efforts, in in, exactly, yeah. as you just um, wanted to elaborate a bit more about that. So um, these two questions are more um, regarded to you. Perfect, thank you. So on the first uh, point, just to answer, when we talk about zero E, it will be an, a new program. So therefore we will have, we have the current single aisle, we have the long range uh, with A350, for instance. All this will continue and zero E will be a separate extra program. And what we have to um, basically uh, it's the other way around. We're not looking for from our existing products in order to then decide what is the additional aircraft that we need to develop. It's the other way around. We need to determine what is the best um, uh, technology mix in order to reach really zero emission flying. And for this, as I said, there, there is quite a lot of technical challenges. I, I exaggerated a little bit when I said, we'll be ready, all this will be in place let's rather focus on ecosystem and infrastructure. Um, it, it's not to say there is no technical challenges. There is a lot of uh, challenges. And the fuel cell just as one of itself, I mean, we're, we're trying to leap to a whole different era and uh, within the limits almost of what is physically uh, possible. So that means um, we, we have to look into each technology, what is the best contribution factor to zero emission flying. And one of it could be indeed really with turboprop. Um, and, and if that is, in the end, if 26 was all the mature uh, technologies we have at that point in time, we determine that is the only and best way, the safest way to go towards 2035, then it will be a turboprop. And the next uh, new uh, program, a zero E program, will be, would in that case, I have to say, be a turboprop. But again, it's not determined yet. 26 will be uh, the year when we will decide. But in that case, um, that could be one factor. Bear in mind, and that's what I tried to demonstrate also with a blended wing body, there will be 
evolution after. So 2035, we'll come with the first program to market and we'll have the first uh, breakthrough technologies, but there will be evolution after. So we're addressing right now uh, rather the small uh, aircraft, uh, regional aircraft, uh, um, small size uh, aircraft types. Um, but after, once we are at a certain level, once we have reached certain level of technologies and, and, and mature technologies, we'll certainly further develop into what we see our uh, existing product ranges uh, thereafter. And the second question, I, I thought it was great. That's why I offered to elaborate a little bit about, because here in those panels, unfortunately, I do understand why, and I even did it myself. Um, and we talk a lot about hydrogen. I try to really bring also the attention to the ZAF, which I think we have managed uh, for in today's panel. But what we don't talk, or I didn't, as a sake of time, didn't talk so much that there is so much more. One hand is our own production. I think the Rolls-Royce colleague did that very impressive. There's a lot to talk about Airbus as well, but I'm not going to do it here. But the other one is operations. Again, the operations will be key. The aircraft technology itself is one factor. But in the end, as I said, we'll have to um, uh, attack every individual segment, every individual contributing factor, um, and we have to eliminate it. And one of it is operations. And we, ha we see a lot of emissions coming from the, the cabin part. And that was a, a good example. Um, so, for instance, the, the consumption of water is a key uh, factor in the consumption of fuel, which then translates into emissions. So by uh, having more smarter system where we can predict very well airlines what they will need in terms of water, plus having, and that's a technology we're working on, having much more uh, efficient water systems, more flexible water systems, that will allow um, the, the airlines in the end to bring on board from from already launch uh, of the, the aircraft, uh, bring on board much less uh, water. And with this impact immediately um, the, the emissions. The other point is the food, not only from an emission standpoint, but just from a simple waste standpoint. And I think in these days, that's a very critical point where look worldwide uh, in terms of food uh, availability and so on. It needs to be addressed. And there we're working on connected cabins, which will help the airlines to really determine, really to, to efficiently plan on what is really actually needed and in order not to waste so much food after each individual flight. So there's a lot of activities in that sector, specifically in the cabin that is ongoing, which we haven't talked about today, but indeed that this is what we're addressing as well. And the last third item of the cabin to mention, in the cabin, um, we, we also look into recycling, uh, the, the, the matter of recycling. Overall aircraft today, Airbus aircraft is, is recyclable and is being recycled uh, to a degree of 92%. This is really good, very, very good news. So let's, let's appreciate for a second. However, the remainder is mainly driven by the cabin. Today, the cabin can only be recycled up to a level of 30%, and that's mainly metals and, and seats and so on. So we're addressing a lot of materials, site walls and so on. So in future, we have much more recycling uh, ability of materials uh, to come. I hope that answers the question. <clears throat> Thank you a lot, Mr. Erlange. Um, I would like to uh, maybe bring a little bit more Mr. Paul Thun and... Um, Mr. Uzum into the, the discussion um, because uh, we have now uh, heard the um, elaboration of the from the uh, producer side and how is it from the consumer side? So um, how are the thinkings from, uh, for example, Pegasus Airlines or KLM with regard to the cabin uh, development? So are, are there any uh, any points or anything that you would like to add to what uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Dreling had just uh, elaborated? Yeah, I think uh, to add out that you are uh, perfectly right. If you uh, um, if you look to uh, to water consumption, that's one uh, big issue which we're trying to uh, to solve. Um, and uh, it it is strange that uh, in regard to uh, say um, fuel consumption, um, traditionally in the aviation industry, we have been. Um, putting there a lot of effort to predict how much fuel you need on certain routes and, and, and so on. Um, and if you look to water consumption, it's um, it's very basic. Uh, and the selector is very roughly uh, selected uh, for that. By the way, uh, I think uh, most of the water is used by uh, toilets uh, in, in 
um, uh, in the airplane. So if you can find a technology uh, solution for that, that would be uh, very, very helpful. The other thing is that uh, if I like to KLM uh, and Air France, uh, we are currently uh, evaluating uh, the complete um, uh, service on board uh, concept uh, with greener uh, objectives in our in the back of our minds. Um, so yes, I agree with that. There is a lot short-term gain in the in the cabin. Uh, in this. Thank you a lot, Mr. Chun. Um, Mr. Uzun, would you also like to add something? Yeah, of course. Apologies. I don't want to take too much of your time, but um, um, I think this brings up another uh, aspect. Uh, consumers are a big part of this. From a carbon uh, footprint perspective, 99.5% uh, of our carbon footprint is in the jet fuel we burn. So it's more relevant what we do on uh, neutralization of the effects of jet fuel. But obviously, it's something that the passengers won't see, won't touch, won't feel. So uh, although it will not be to the same impact, uh, impact to the environment, we find certain demonstrative actions as important uh, to basically engage consumers, you know, to uh, differentiate ourselves, etc. Uh, and just to explain the, you know, difficulty, uh, this is something we're working on right now. We want to remodel our uh, onboard offering uh, inside the aircraft. Uh, so, you know, we do have some bits and pieces of um, materials that we use that are not in the circular uh, regeneration cycle. So we want to uh, use different products, but then we also have to move to a, a more challenging uh, waste collection within the aircraft. And it's not only sufficient to do that because we need to make sure that at every airport we land, the airport facilities are able to receive that sort of differentiated uh, waste disposal and dispose it accordingly. So it becomes a stakeholder engagement issue, etc., uh, etc. Et it's also a you know cabin arrangement. It's a different challenge entirely for low cost carriers. But um, we have uh, a number of initiatives that we're working on right now. Uh, onboard offering is one. Use of electric vehicles on the uh, ramp is another one, for example. I can think of uh, some carbon offsetting schemes or, that will match our operations with the passengers uh, is also something we're looking into. There are various other aspects, but hopefully in the next uh, two, three years, uh, you'll be hearing a lot uh, more about this in live action. Thank you a lot. Um, I know that there are, or there is at least one for the question, but uh, at this point, I've got to uh, close, unfortunately, uh, with nine to the clock this Q&A round, um, because we need to continue with the uh, second panel at 11.25 uh, uh, due to some time conflicts that uh, some of our uh, panelists have. So at this uh, stage, I would really like to thank uh, Mr. Al Langlet, uh, Mr. Paul Schoen, <clears throat> Ms. Aliusen and uh, Mr. Jason Sutcliffe, uh, Sutcliffe, who has already left us, for uh, their very, very, very precious and uh, great uh, inputs um, for the discussion in the end. Um, I think that uh, we have gained some uh, information that, from point of views that uh, maybe are a little bit out of the box sometimes, but uh, are also important in order to uh, keep an eye on the overall strategy to a carbon uh, net zero emission uh, up until 2035. So. Um, Thank you a lot to all of you who have been here. Uh, thanks a lot to the audience. We are going to close this first panel right now and we will start um, the panel two um, in a few moments, so at 11.25. If you want to join us, just close this page and uh, on the agenda, join the second uh, panel um, in a few moments. Thank you a lot. And uh, from ACP side, uh, we are really looking forward to meeting you again in the new future and to seeing you in the um, B2B sessions in the following two days. Thank you a lot and uh, see you soon in the second panel.